Erica Jean gained international fame with the success of her 1973 best-selling novel, Fear of Flying. In 1994, her name would yet again find a place on bestseller list across the country with her midlife memoir, Fear of 50. In her 16 volumes of poetry and prose, she has continued to celebrate the strengths and passions of women. Her latest effort is Inventing Memory, a novel of mothers and daughters, and I am pleased to have her back at this table. Welcome back. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Good. Uh, tell me about this book, which I have not read, but I want you to tell me about it. It is uh, Inventing Memory. It's about memory, and it's about the it's notion about of a family that comes to the United States uh, from Russia. It's an, it's an homage to the elders of the tribe. Yes. It's an homage to memory, really. Somebody said, oh, I guess it's a Jewish joy luck club. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it, tra you know, well, you it, it transcends yeah. you know, ethnic barriers. It, it is a novel that takes 100 years. It starts with the old woman in the family, the matriarch. Actually, it starts in 2005 with the great-granddaughter yes. researching her relative. And she finds a picture of a woman who looks just like her. Ah. And then we flash back in time to the year 1905, when the old Sarah is coming to America. She's, she leaves Russia on the heels of a pogrom in which she loses three men in her family, including her infant. And she comes to America alone with only her talent to paint and draw. She becomes a photo retoucher, a catalog artist, and so on. And finally, a fashionable portrait painter in New York in this yeasty period of 1905 when there are anarchists and labor unionists and so on. So her story begins the saga. Then her daughter, who is a flapper of the 20s, Salome, takes the story forward into the 20s and 30s. And her daughter, Sally Skye, the most famous folk singer of the 60s, takes the story forward into the 50s, 60s. And finally, you get to young Sarah again. So it's a circular story. And young story. Sarah's the one who found the picture. Of, who found of... the picture. It's a circular story, a kind of homage to the foremothers of the tribe, yeah. um, an attempt to rescue the Jewish women in America from the clutches of Philip Roth. <laughs> because we to are... To say what about them? <laughs> well, we are not Mrs. Portnoy yeah. or the Jewish American princess. And we come from these amazing, strong feisty, yeasty women. And my characters are not particularly perfect. I mean, many of them are very flawed. But there's a tremendous strength in these women. And I, I felt that somebody had to do that, that the Jewish American woman had become a cliche of literature. So you wanted to? I wanted to, to redeem her to, to some... To redeem the image of Jewish women? In a sense, I okay. did. What does memory have to do with it? Well. It has a lot to do with it, because we are people of the book, we are people of memory. And my novel starts with this uh, quote, which I think comes from the Talmud. The only truly dead are those who have been forgotten. And actually, when we keep the past alive, when we talk about our parents, our grandparents, just as we were doing a little while ago, yeah. we are bringing them to life. And so inventing memory is really a recreation of these people through, through the love one bears them. As long as you're talking about them and describing them, they're not dead. Yeah. So in that sense, I Inventing Memory is very much a novel about the past and how the past informs and, the but present. But the inventing is what throws me. Well, I believe it's, a, it's an oxymoron as a title. At one time, I was going to call the book of Blessed Memory. Yeah. Um, I believe that when the elders of the tribe tell their stories, they invent. They always heighten the they stories. They elaborate, they invent. They always elaborate. Dramatic and then flourishes. Right. And also, memory itself invents, because yeah. we don't remember exactly what happened. We remember those heightened moments. Then when you take all the stories that are passed down through a family, and you begin to make a chronicle out of them, what you have is something that's mythic. It's true, but it's also invention. And that's what I mean by inventing memory. When you, how long did it take you to write this? Three years. When you set out to write it, how did you go about writing it? Did you think about your own family a lot and say, I'm going to, I'm going to translate some of the memories I have of my own family? Did you go in discovery and reading? Did you what? It's a very mysterious process how a novel comes to be. I had interviewed a lot of my relatives for Fear of 50. Yeah. And I saw that there were enormous possibilities in showing a century 
and how it impacts on a family. And I began to get excited by that idea. And I began writing in the voice of the old woman, thinking this is going to be a hundred-year-old woman telling her tale on an oral history tape for her great-granddaughter who bears her name. That's where I started. So I began to write in that voice to see if that voice worked. And always for me, it's whether or not I can get the voice of the book that tells me whether or not the book will go. Uh, Henry Miller used to say, I, I write 50 pages and then I hear the fetal heartbeat. Yeah. And it's true for me, very much so. So I had to do a lot of research. I had to go and sit in YIVO Institute and look at these photo archives of pogroms in Russia and all these things that I didn't know. I had a little background because I grew up in a large extended family. On the west side of Manhattan. Uh, right, with my grandparents. And I heard their stories. But then I had to contextualize these stories by doing a lot of research. You also believe that memory is what makes us human. Absolutely. You know, it is what separates us. It's the crux of our humanity. Absolutely the crux of it. When we lose our memories, we lose our identities. And actually, I think one becomes a writer because one doesn't want these things to be lost. When I start getting really excited about a new book, I have this passionate feeling, I've got to get this down. I've got to preserve it. I don't want these stories to be lost. And I get really excited at that moment. So I think it's the thing that empowers us. I also think telling a story is a kind of magic. Telling a story can bring back the dead. Telling a story is a kind of prayer. All these things go into inventing memory. One of the things that happens if you do what I do as long as I have done it, it is that people you interview die. Just recently, Charles Corralt, Arthur Johnny Lyman. Versace. I never, all of whom I interviewed. Mm -hmm. I saw those interviews. You know, and it's because it becomes part of the memory of that person, mm -hmm. and a l record, you know, to see. And the great irony for me: guess who I'd never interviewed? My parents, who oh. were both dead. I had this great plan once. I bought a farm to make it happen, and I put horses on the farm because of my father, which was when I was living in Washington, I was going to go down and record because, you know, whatever modic, you know, whatever moderate skills I have, it is the capacity to talk to people about their experience and their emotion and their feelings. And alas, pull out all yeah, those alas, marvelous I did, stories. I never did. You, know. you see, what I'm hearing from people who are reading Inventing Memory now is that they now, if, if, they're, if their elders are alive, they want to ask questions. Yeah. They want to do an oral history. Because it is who I am and where I, what, I'm, what larger context I'm part of. Exactly. And it's something that we generally come to in the middle of our lives. We start to make sense of all these yeah. things. We get interested in genealogy and roots. I'm really sorry you never interviewed your parents. That would have been extraordinary. So am I. I mean, I had all these conversations, but I've never on film and tape, you know, conversations. I mean, one of the great things, I once went to a family, large family graveyard with my father, and he had this extraordinary intelligence, and he could walk through and point to every tombstone and tell you the history of that person, you know, which was extraordinary. But it was about memory, and it was about continuity, and it was about connection, all that stuff. So if you were to write a novel about your family, you might start with that scene yeah. of walking through a sure. cemetery with sure. somebody and having them fill your head with, I don't know where novels come from, but it's something like that. Finding a scene. It's something like finding a scene, finding the voice, maybe the voice of your father talking to you, it would have to be the thing that would move you, yeah. not the thing that would move me. But all these bits and pieces eventually come together in what becomes a novel. I don't start knowing where the novel's going to go. I start with a character and a predicament. I know what the predicament is. I know who the character is, now, and in, I know her voice. In this case, the character you start with is the is, character who comes over on the boat from mm -hmm, the pogrom. Right. And her predicament is she's going to a new place not knowing what her future is. And she's 17 years old, and she barely knows the language, um, and she's coming to America on a boat because it's her last chance. It's absolutely the last chance that she has. It has staggered me how these people came to America knowing nothing, hmm. having no language, having nothing. I mean, it's really extraordinary. What, a, what an incredibly tough people they were. When you... Uh... When you, you say writing is, is about love, 
because it's so hard to do, you wouldn't do it for any other reason. Yes? I write for love. Meaning? Um, it's so labor intensive. If you weren't obsessed with getting the story out, you wouldn't do it. You, you would do something easier. I mean, I just realized that I could, have, I could have spent my entire life investing money if I wanted to do something that yeah. was really profitable. But and less I think, painful. And less painful. But I think you become a writer because it's a curse. You have to. There are stories that you feel you've been given to tell, and you have to tell them. And once you've had that experience of sitting in a room and spinning tales and discovering who you are by writing about it, nothing else is as satisfying. It's certainly a difficult profession. Inventing Memory, a novel of mothers and daughters, Erica Zhang. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.